the chat box. So we'll try to answer at the end of these uh, webinars. And uh, for today's schedule, we have Professor Wan Tiu, got the privilege to have the ISPN president with us, even if 11 p.m. in the Singapore. And after, uh, Jeffrey will introduce uh, this webinar, and Norma Maria kindly will introduce our uh, speakers. Thanks for you all for giving your time and energy for ISPN education. It's pleased to have all of you with us. George Diaz, Ana Laura, uh, Marcelo, and Sudipta. And please feel free, uh, want you, and kind thanks for our audience that's still increasing. Thank you and welcome everyone. Okay. Please, we, um... you, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, you, you want me, I go ahead then. Okay. Uh, welcome yes, yeah. to this um, webinar. Thank you so much for uh, you know coming, joining us. Um, you know, I really want to thank Nelsie, uh, Jeffrey, and Maria for actually making this uh, this this set of webinars. Right now, we're on to our last and twelfth, and it's been very very successful. And 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 the success actually is due to all of you who have taken part and joining us. You know, even though it's uh, different times of the day for everyone right but you know it, it shows us a sense that you know people are interested in pediatric neurosurgery and you know so the education committee of the ISPN you know working together with all the speakers are here to actually make sure that you know we give you good education and of course uh, I'm just privileged to be the president of the society for this year and actually it's my privilege to actually uh, share with you the fact that you know we're trying to ask you all to join us as part of the ISPN. Uh, and so I've got some slides to just to show you to say, please, uh, today help us achieve our mission. And our mission actually is to improve the well-being, health, and welfare of children requiring neurosurgical care throughout the world. And so we are asking that, you know, why don't you consider joining the ISPN? But, and to, when you do that, you join a global community of dedicated pediatric neurosurgeons from all over the world will help to support the SBN in its mission to prevent to advance pediatric neurosurgery across the world. And we actually offer reduced rates for members of low and low middle income countries, which is based on the World Bank list. And for students, right, starting this year, we actually offer a free membership for students as well as residents, those in training. And what do you get when you become a member? Uh, you get access, this is for paying members, sorry, access to the Office Journal of the Society, which is the Child's Number System. You get discounted registration for the annual meeting and also for face-to-face uh, -face education events. You have access to the guide. The guide actually is a very special, like a digital textbook that's going to be regularly updated so that you actually get the latest and good pictures and videos, uh, right, too, which is uh, you can find uh, on the website, our website. You, there are also international fellowship opportunities of course, free education courses and webinars like this. We actually have a fantastic Clash of the Titan webinar series where we you know, put two specialists of certain area in certain parts of, uh, of uh, certain areas of pediatric neurosurgery to kind of argue or debate each other, right? But the idea is that people get the latest and get also both sides of the argument, right? And it's a, it's a wonderful way of you know, exposing a topic and there are some uh, your previous webinars that are already on the ISPN website. You know, look at them. Of course, we also will provide you with up to date scientific information through our case studies on uh, on Twitter and other social media, right? And also have yearly newsletters, and then a lot of basically networking opportunities with member access to the ISPN, right? So this is just a price for ISPN membership, right? So for, for most of you who are either students, okay, so we have this new uh, student membership with, uh, with no fee, but of course we require proof of student status. And then for those who are training, right, you can actually come in as uh, candidate members. Again, it's free. All right, so what can you do? Okay, for find out which relevant is category, uh, which category is relevant to you, fill in the online application form on SBN website, provide your CV right, with uh, supporting letters from active ISBN members, 
it may have some issues looking for them, but you know, right to the uh, ISPN secretary and she will help you to actually uh, to allocate people who can help you with that. So don't worry, right? And then um, your application will review and then we'll not notify you once your membership status is uh, activated. And so for people to contact, right? You may want to take a picture of this, right? So Suchanda is our membership committee chair. This is an email. Sandy Lam from US is the membership co-chair. And there's a special staff on our ISPN um, secretariat called Christina. And she can be uh, available and contacted at this number. Right, so thank you so much for um, bearing with me for this time because I know you're all waiting to really get into the real gist of the webinar, which is what you're here for. So hope you consider joining us. Jeffrey, back to you. I'll be very brief to just add what a privilege it is to participate in this series. As Nelsie has alluded and Juan Tu has outlined, this is the last presentation for this academic year. Uh, we are pleased to have uh, a number of scholars to present to you this morning about imaging of the child's nervous system. And I think you'll find these talks very interesting and very, very well done. Um, with that, I'll just turn it over to Nor Maria to begin our individual uh, uh, introductions. I just want to add uh, my note of appeal to you to what Juan Tu just said. Human beings are all about community, and there's no community richer than the ISPN. There are people from literally all around the globe, interesting, colorful people, and they're united in this single mission of trying to do things that help children. And as a result, they tend to be smart, fun, people very dedicated to children, warm. It's a wonderful community. Uh, it's a great community online. It's a great community in person. We are very, very welcoming to young up and coming learners at all levels. It's one of the most warm outreaching communities that I've ever come across in my whole neurosurgical career. So that's just a personal welcome personal encouragement to hopefully add on to what Wantu said, which is spot on. So with that, we'll turn uh, the introductions over to Norm Maria. We have several great lectures for you this morning with a wish that I uh, hope that you find as good of a community in the ISPN as we all have. Norm Maria, could you start introducing our speakers, please? Thank, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be a part of this amazing course. So I'm really happy to introduce all of our speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Sudipta Kumar Mukherjee. He's working as an assistant professor at the National Institute of Neurosciences in Dhaka, Bangladesh. We know him well from his very active WhatsApp group called as a Global Pediatric Neurosurgery Group. Most of us are a member of it and uh, actively participate in uh, his very nice discussion and cases. Uh, today, we are privileged to have him to deliver a lecture on computerized tomographic imaging of the brain in children. Dr. Sudipta, welcome to the webinar and the podium is all yours now. Thank you for giving me a chance to present a, uh, in a session. <clears throat> You can now share your screen. Okay, I, I, I am trying. So now my screen is uh, seen by uh, other people. Is it okay? Yes, we can see, but you need to uh, make it a screen a slideshow. Can you please start the slideshow? Is it okay? Uh, no, we cannot see the slideshow yet. 
we can see the slide, but it's not uh, in in full full screen mode. The last button on the right side, please, and can be works. It show my screen is sharing. If can be better, okay. If not, we can see your slide. We saw two slides at the same time, but it's it's okay if you can do better. Now it's okay. We still seeing two slides, but you can try to to do it. You can just go into the display settings. Uh, you can see the tab, the display settings, and just uh, see if you can change the setting and just turn off the preview on the right side. Display settings is, is uh, on top on the first bar. I cannot the find. I cannot find display setting. Just on the top bar. On the on the top bar, you know. Top bar. Yes. yes. So, Deepta, at the on the top of your slides, can you see the three words "show task bar display yes. setting"? Yes. Okay. Click on display setting. Go up. Put your arrow up. Click on display setting. Bring your arrow up. I cannot see your arrow. Sudipta, where okay. is... Bring your arrow up to the top of the screen of your slides, which says display settings. Can you see that? So further up, up, somehow all the way up on top, top, on top of the slides. Oh, somehow all the way up. Bring your mouse up. All the way to the top. Sorry. Bring the slides up now. No, no, don't click that. Go all the way to the top. Bring it to the top. Top of your screen. Ah, okay, the second one, next one. Display setting. Yeah, show taskbar now, display setting. Okay, next one. No, no, you're in the wrong place. I'll be in the wrong place. Uh, the next one, display setting. Go to display setting. Oh, get it, get it. Okay, click. Okay, just say swap. No, press the one, the top what? one, swap center view. Yes, click this, click that, click. No, the first one, yes, click that. No, no. Your mouse may not be working well, I think that's why. Probably. Oh, mouse is okay, but there is some problem. Maybe, um, Jeff, what do you think? We ask the next speaker to, uh, Maria, we ask the next speaker to go ahead first while... Uh, sure. 
Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think that we can uh, move on to Dr. Marcelo Strauss. Uh, Dr. Marcelo Strauss will be delivering a lecture on neurosonography of the skull and the brain in children. Dr. Marcelo Strauss is basically a neuroradiologist from um, Brazil. He's working as a pediatric radiologist in the in the Albert Einstein Hospital in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He's a young pediatric, pediatric radiologist and um, he, with a great interest in educational activities. Dr. Marcelo, welcome to the webinar. We are pleased to have you here with us today. So the floor is all yours now. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just share my screen here. One second, okay. Uh, Okay. Can you see my screen? Perfectly. Thanks. Okay. Yes. Uh, just going to make it a little bit brighter in here. Okay, that's better. Uh, can you guys hear me well as well? My, I'm not sure. Just if my audio is okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, thank you for the uh, It's a honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'll be talking a little bit about uh, ultrasound skull and uh, brain in children. Uh, okay, so a brief overview of the presentation. Uh, so I'll start by talking a little bit about neonatal brain ultrasound. Uh, I like to touch these two subjects, so cerebral biometry and ventricular dilation and Doppler ultrasound. Afterwards, I'm going to talk a little bit about neonatal skull ultrasound. And this is going to be more focused on cranial suture evaluation. And I'll just briefly talk about other applications and we'll finish with some take home messages. Uh, so beginning with uh, just uh, neonatal brain ultrasound. The thing I talk about is uh, what are the things that, uh, so for ventricular biometry, what are the things that radiologists measure? So <clears throat> I know that we have a, um, there are people from all around the world here. So uh, this is something that I feel that is interesting because of this. Uh, there is no consensus on uh, what is the best measurement. So this is a, uh, <clears throat> a systematic review from 2010. Uh, and what the, uh, I put the QR codes for the uh, articles that I'm talking about on the side. So if anyone wants to. So the link can use it. So what the authors did here in this article, they basically did a systematic review for uh, what, what is used for ultrasound measurement of the lateral ventricles in neonates. And well, this is basically this is from the, the article itself showing what they found in 2010, what were the most used uh, measurements. So we we have a lot of measurements here. There's the ventricular index. Uh, so this, I'm sorry, this is a uh, coronal uh, view of the ultrasound, uh, a transfrontal ultrasound, and uh, we're at the level of the uh, the anterior horns of the lateral ventricles. So these, uh, let me see if I can switch this to the laser. Okay, so uh, these uh, dark structures, the this we would call the uh, anechogenic or hypoechogenic structures. These are the ventricles. And so there are several measurements for these which can be used. So the ventricular index, which is this measure from the fox to the lateral border, uh, the anterior horn width, which is the, the width of the anterior horn, the uh, ventricular axis, which goes along the axis of the, uh, of the anterior ventricular horn, and also the uh, hemispheric width. So there are many measurements, at least in this paper, they, they, they specify uh, these uh, four measurements uh, plus a uh, ratio, which is the frontal horn ratio, which is basically is the ventricular index divided by the frontal, uh, the hemispheric width uh, on the coronal image. And on the sagittal image, there are also many other um, measurements that can be done. So ventricular height or telemoccipital distance. And we uh, expect everyone to know exactly what these are, but it's just to show that there are many measurements. And if well, basically, if there are many measurements, it's possibly because people have not uh, got into an agreement of which one is the best or which one uh, will uh, aid the uh, requesting physician the most. So it is important, and this is what I'd like to uh, bring up here, is that uh, the requesting physician and the radiology department, they have an understanding of this and that uh, they talk in order to make things um, uh, reproducible. So we need to uh, try uh, our best to 
uh, always use the same measurements and always see which measurements make sense for the requesting physician. Uh, and expanding on this subject, there's this another, uh, this is a more recent paper from 2019, uh, in which they, they use another uh, type of measurement, which is the frontal occipital and frontal temporal horn ratios, which, well, this, this slide is a little bit messy, but basically what they did here, and this is, the, the, these images are from the article itself, uh, they did measurements of the uh, bifrontal horn dimensions, the uh, bitemporal horn dimensions, by occipital horn dimensions and the biparietal dimension, which is basically the, the width of the, the, the internal skull. And they compared in patients who had underwent uh, brain ultrasound and brain MR uh, with a very short time gap. Uh, and what they noticed is that the frontal occipital horn ratio and the frontal temporal horn ratio, they correlate very well between ultrasound measurements and between MR measurements. And also, uh, the ultrasound measurements correlate very well with the um, the actual ventricular volume, uh, which are which were measured on the 3D uh, MRs. So basically, what I'm doing here is that there are many measurements that can be made. So I guess it's important to know what measurements when we as radiologists are reporting this, uh, and when you're uh, you're receiving the reports, it's important to know what measurements were made. Uh, in order to uh, keep things uh, comparable. Uh, and so now that I've shown you this, I'd also like to discuss, now that I've shown you the ventricular biometry, so there are many ways of measuring it, but is there something that we can use as, uh, in, what is normal? So what is the cutoff? Um, there's this as well. Uh, this I think is, is also an important uh, issue. Uh, this is a, a, a little bit, it's, 11 years old paper published in radiology uh, in which the authors, they put in the reference values for neonatal cerebral ventricles. And so on this paper, if you go through the supplemental material, you'll see that they actually have tables for um, patients uh, varying by age and also by um, uh, gestational, gestational age and chronological age. Uh, but um, these are not enough. I mean, this is from, one center, and it's. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to criticize the the study itself. I'm just saying that it is uh, a very uh, narrow uh, data set. So there are data on what is normal, what is abnormal. But I guess the most important thing, uh, at least in my experience, is and when I'm uh, talking to the physicians, uh, the neurosurgeons, what they most want to know is actually. Uh, how is the patient evolving? I mean, is it larger or is it is the dilation more or less than it was in the last exam? Uh, has changed? What cases have changed? So, and I can only answer this if I'm doing the same measurements uh, between the exams. And just to uh, reinforce this, this is a more recent paper from Pediatric Radiology. Basically, the European Society for Pediatric Radiology they published in 2019 uh, what the strategic research agenda was uh, to in order to improve imaging. And this is a quote from the article itself. So areas for future study would include wide variation of ventricular size in the newborns and young children, which is crucial knowledge to identify hydrocephalus. So this is, and I like this because this is from the European Society of Pediatric Radiology. So uh, I know that in the in Europe, there are many uh, non radiologists that do uh, head ultrasound. And so I guess they have a lot of uh, different groups doing things. And they do have um, a wide variety of not only measurements, but professionals doing this. So it shows how heterogeneous our knowledge of this is and how we actually do the exams. So I, I guess this is just to, uh, to reinforce the idea that there there is no consensus of what is a normal, at least on, on ultrasound, what is a normal ventricle size. Uh, and so I guess my suggestion here is not to get too attached to a number in order to compare what would, would be normal or abnormal in the population in general, but rather uh, compare it to the patient itself and how he's going. Uh, so now I'll talk a little bit, uh, I'll talk a little bit about Doppler ultrasound. So just a brief review of the concept of the Doppler effect or 
uh, Doppler ultrasound. So Doppler ultrasound is the usage of Doppler effect to evaluate movement of fluid. And the Doppler effect, I'm um, sure most of you remember, but just in case you don't, is the, the perceived change of frequency in the energy waves as they source and the observer move toward or away from each other. So this is basically, in school, what we learn is the, the sirens from the cars when they, the, the ambulance is moving. If it's moving towards you, the siren sound gets, uh, uh, the pitch goes up. And if it's moving away from you, it gets lower. And this is the the idea, right? The waves they even though the they're generating they're being generated for, with the same frequency. If if it's moving, then the perceived there will be a difference uh, in the perceived effect. And when we're talking about the usage of Doppler and ultrasound, uh, there are two most common applications. So the first one is this one. This is a a axial uh, so a, a transtemporal view of the the brain. We're seeing the polygon here and Basically, it's a color, the color Doppler, which is a color coded image. You can add color to what is moving inside the the well within the image. And the idea here is that this um, this bar here it shows either if the movement is towards the uh, probe, towards the probe, which is this this side here, or away from the probe. And so if it's towards, it will be red. And this is, we can change this. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, we can just reverse this. It's not uh, always like this red up and blue down. But if it's going towards the, the transducer, it'll be red. And the faster it's going, the brighter it will be. And if it's going away, it'll be blue. And again, if it, the faster it's going, the brighter it will be. And if it's not moving, it will be uh, dark. So this is uh, color doubler. It's pretty much subjective and we don't we use it but it, it doesn't add that much um information in the, the quantitative quantitative point of view and so the other uh common application of doppler is one which is known as spectral doppler and it's called spectral because we get the spectrum the spectrum uh, we measure how particles are moving on this region here you can see the small box here and it shows us the velocity uh, of these particles throughout time, how it's behaving. And through this spectrum, we can get lots of measurements, such as the peak systolic value and diastolic value, uh, I'm sorry, uh, or even the RI, which stands for resistivity index. And this is one of the most uh, discussed ones in the literature. So the resistivity index, what is this? It's basically an index. Uh, if the uh, peak systolic value uh, velocity, I'm sorry, and the end diastolic velocity. And it's basically, uh, uh, if I were to make it very sim simplified, it's uh, a means to assess the resistance in a pulsatile vascular system. So to know if there is, uh, if the flow of blood is, if it's going easy or it's um, getting resistance to it. Uh, and so this, this is more useful. And uh, these, uh, all these data, though, the spectral waveform, it is more useful than simply the color or coded images. And so there are uh, usages for all of these, um, all of these uh, values, uh, like peak systolic uh, velocity. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the RI, which I guess for the neonatals is the one that is most used. Uh, so it's a simple way to assess. You can use the RI to uh, assess intracranial uh, hemodynamics. And with this, you can correlate it with uh, intracranial pressure in very specific scenarios. So this is uh, this has been done since the 1990s, but um, this is a, a 2004 paper on this in which the authors, they basically did the, the spectral evaluation of neonates with um, a before and after uh, of the cerebral arteries, before and after uh, CSF taps showing that uh, it correlates. So when they tap and, and they remove CSF, the pressure, pressure lowers, and then this changes how the spectral waveform is. And this is another more uh, recent paper from 2018, uh, Nature Scientific Reports, uh, in which the authors, they, they use uh, what is called the fontanel compression to evaluate uh, brain hem hemodynamics, and then use this to um, correlate with intracranial pressure. And I'll show you what this means here. So this is a case of a Mayo two day old term infant, which had, so this is the coronal uh, view. We can see the ventricles here, they're dilated, they're ballooned. 
And you can see that there is a hemorrhage, a, a germinal matrix hemorrhage bilaterally. Uh, it's larger at the right side of the image. Uh, and this patient underwent Doppler ultrasound. And when seeing, uh, looking at the spectral waveform, we can see here that there is peak systolic uh, velocity and that there is diastole throughout the heart, the, 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 the heartbeats with uh, with a resistivity index calculated at uh, 0.78. So about 30 days after ultrasound, uh, the patient um, involved with this. So you can see that the there is, I'm sorry, there is more dilation than there was before. And uh, there are still clots here. We can see that it looks worse, but we can uh, use this to quantify how worse it is. So what has been done here is the probe is at the uh, patient's uh, fontanelle. And when you see the, the, the arrow here, this is when the uh, what we, we compress the fontanelle and we add pressure into the, uh, a little bit of pressure into the uh, intracranial uh, compartment. And what happens when we do this, if this is uh, hypertensive to the point where uh, the patient is losing the ability to compensate for this, we stop diastolic flow. So this is to show that this hydrocephalus is uh, likely already um, in carrying blood flow. So it, 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 uh, and there is very little space for extra pressure. Um, and so the patient underwent uh, shunting. You can see the shunt here. And look, uh, the difference between the spectral waveforms. So here, the compression and diastolic flow is present. And here, the compression, diastolic flow absent showing that this changes. So we, uh, this is a way to measure how, how complacent the system still is uh, with the Doppler ultrasound. So just one thing that I find that is very important to know about Doppler ultrasound, this. Uh, it, it's important to know that there are other factors that can influence uh, resistivity index. So if the patient has extensive uh, hypoxic ischemic brain injury, or if he has a patent ductus arteriosus, he can sleep. So it's we're studying the hemodynamics and we're inferring how the pressure, intracranial pressure is based on this, but we're not actually measuring the, the intracranial pressure. So it's the hemodynamics that we're, we're assessing. So just to show you a case, this is a preterm. Uh, no um, brain abnormalities, but he had a patent ductus arteriosus and he had a recipient of one because what happened was during the diastole, the flow would go to, to the brain, uh, the systole, the, the blood flow would go through the brain, and in the diastole, the ductus would steal all of the diastolic blood flow. So what happens here is that you get zero diastole flow, uh, which increases the RI, but it's not because uh, there is uh, uh, intracranial hypertension. Uh, and I'd like to briefly talk about another use of the Doppler ultrasound on hydrocephalus, um, which is CSF usually cannot be detected by Doppler, but when there is um, Crepuscular elements between the CSF blood, for example, in patients who had uh, ventricular hemorrhage, uh, you can detect the, 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 these crepuscular elements. They help us detect flow. So, in case in which the patient has a um, the, the, the newborn has a uh, germinal matrix hemorrhage with um, uh, sorry with um, uh, intracranial uh, hemorrhage, uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. We can use this the, the blood cells to measure the, the flow to actually see the flow. So just to illustrate this, this is a case of a preterm uh, newborn, uh, which had a large uh, germinal matrix hemorrhage, and we can see that there is uh, dilation of the ventricles. The ventricles are ballooned. You can also see that the, the ventricles, the wall of the ventricles, is very hyperechoic, uh, showing that there is inflammation of the the ventricles. So likely uh, there has been. Uh, hemorrhage into the ventricles. And so this is what we can see with the Doppler. So this is the uh, the, the acudit, the, the fourth ventricle is here. And we can actually see, not the flow, but actually CSF flow through the ventricles going uh, down in this image and going up in this image. So this is just so another, um, uh, another use of the Doppler ultrasound. Um, and now to just... Uh, the last part of the talk, I'd like to talk about cranial suture ultrasound. So this isn't something new. It's been described in 1990, since 1997. And basically uh, what we do here is we use the linear uh, high resolution ultrasound uh, to assess the major cranial sutures uh, in patients with suspected cranial stenosis. It's as all ultrasound are, this is a, a non-invasive exam with no need for uh, sedation or ionizing radiation. 
but it is limited in children, in older children, children over uh, one year of age, because the scalp uh, scalp starts getting a little bit thick, and usually they not every baby, but they usually start getting a lot more of hair, and all of this um, tends to separate these sutures from the the transducer. Since these are very uh, very thin structures, we need to have the um, the transducer is very close to to able to see them very well. So the older the, the children is, the, the harder it gets. So usually um, after one year of age, it, it's not that useful anymore. So basically, what we do in this um, in this cranial ultrasound, uh, this is the image uh, from, uh, from an article. Uh, what we do is we will just run with the uh, transducer. Through uh, along the the sagittal uh, coronal metopic uh, lambdoid sutures, the, the the major sutures, and we will try to see this in full form. So uh, I'll explain this image a little bit better here. So I'm um, sorry, I have this. Okay, this this okay better. So basically, this image, uh, this is the, this is what we're seeing here. It's it's like a zoomed in view of of this rectangular arrow and the and the CT. And you can see here that this is the suture, the, the blue arrow is pointing to the suture, and the red here is the bone. So this is the suture, and the white, this white line here, which is highlighted in red here, this is the bone. And you can see the suture. So what we want to see is exactly this. So we want to see the bone, the bone that both bones are not touching each other. Uh, we want to see a, a thin gap between them, which is the, the, the suture. And so just so you can understand the image, the this part here is gel. We use a lot of gel so we don't have to uh, squish, uh, use too much force. And this between the gel and the and the bone is the skull. So we'll do this image along all of the major sutures, and we can assess to see if there is fusion of any one of them. So I just brought two cases to illustrate this. This is a four-month-old Mayo uh, investigation of craniosynthesis. And so these were the images. So the left corona image, we could see here that there was this thin gap uh, on the lambdoids, the thin gap here and here, and the coronal, the thin gap here. But on the sagittal, it was uh, uh, a continuous bone. So there, there is no gap. And the, uh, the CT, the 3D CT uh, structure. So the left coronal was uh, patent, uh, the, the left lambdoid as well. But here you can see that there is fusion of the which is shown in the ultrasound in this way. So we lose the the, the marker, the thin hypochoic marker. Uh, this is another case, this is the second case, a male one, one day old suspected prenatal craniostenosis. And look, here we can see even the bone that the bone does angulate here. So the uh, frontal bones are angulating and you cannot see the metopic suture. And this patient also went CT, we can see that the, the trigonocephalic aspect of the, the, the head. Uh, and lastly, so how useful is this? This is a, a how useful is a cranial suture ultrasound? Uh, this is a recent uh, reveal uh, from 2021. Um, and so this is just to show you the that there are many studies already on this subject, uh, most of them with very high sensitivity and very high specificity. Um, and I guess, in my opinion, this is a very useful uh, exam for, especially for posterior plagiocephaly uh, in patients who you just want to reassure or discard the idea that there might be a craniostenosis. Uh, this is a very easy way to assess these uh, sutures, and it's uh, very non-traumatic for the, the patient. Uh, just briefly talk about uh, other applications. We can use ultrasound for other applications, such as um, talk with uh, birth canal trauma or uh, even normal traumas. For this example, a patient who had a, a fracture uh, on the temporal bone, we can see here the CTs. And we, we could actually see the fracture on ultrasound as well. We can see cephalohematomas and uh, other uh, scalp abnormalities on ultrasound. It, it, it can be quite useful. Uh, but I guess this is more widespread than the suture uh, examination. So the take home messages, uh, like remind you that Brain is a uh, brain ultrasound is a safe and accessible neuroimaging tool. Um, just this is something really important. So adequate imaging depends on many factors, uh, including the operator's experience, quality of the equipment, and patient anatomy. Uh, so we do not have robust newborn ultrasound biometry uh, data. Uh, 
Uh, and this is something which has a potential for multidisciplinary research. And just to remind you that skull ultrasound uh, ability, and it has been widely validated as a tool for the diagnosis of craniostenosis. So thank you very much. I hope this was uh, uh, useful in any way. What a great talk. What a great talk. That was, that was a tremendous summary in a short period of time. That was fa fabulous. It's a wonderful Nelson? talk. I, yeah. uh, actually, I do have a little question here. Uh, I'm just, you know, there's an increasing interest in functional ultrasound imaging. There are more animal models, and they say that it's a hemodynamic based neuroimaging technique. So, what, uh, what are, what's your view about this application uh, in the real life of the functional ultrasound imaging that has said to be, you know, something that, that might be, you know, work as well as the fMRI? Uh, so I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not sure, uh, when you say functional ultrasound, do you mean, uh, because there are more there... animal models. I think that this is a basically, you know, something that is not much, in, you know, more in than animal models, a research type of, an, um, you know, modality. So they say that it's basically a hemodynamic based neuroimaging technique, um, that might, you know, work as good as an fMRI. Uh, so that's, that this is one question. I think that is not very applicable. I just hopped in this question. Just, I think you can skip it. Uh, maybe it's out okay. of scope <laughs> if you like. Sure. Uh, I think, Norm Maria, I think that that's a great, that that's a really interesting topic. But I think yes. right now we have to, we have to stay <laughs> uh, on time. On time, yeah. Nelsie, are we going to Jorge or back to Sudipta? Or what, what, where are we at with regard to our next speaker? Uh, if you are ready, uh, maybe we can go to Sudipta. Uh, can you try again? If not, we can just uh, move to George's uh, lecture. And yes. thanks again, Marcelo Strauss. It was an unbelievable lecture. Maybe for question of time, if you can stay with us at the end, we can try to, to deliver more questions for our, our audience. Yes, sure, of course. Uh, I, I sent my slide to uh, Linda already. Good. Okay, Linda, uh, can you uh, show the slide? Thank you, Linda, for your support. Okay. Can, can we go to... Can I start? Presentation mode, yeah. Uh, OK, so. Yes, please. Thank you very much for giving me a chance. And sorry that I made some delay for technical problem. Uh, my first uh, slide, that is CT scan. Actually, this is a X-ray. This is a pencil beam of X-ray where a X-ray passed through the examination uh, part of the body, and it uh, there is a detector in the opposite side. That's uh, by that detector the uh, absorption uh, parameter is uh, measured, and it this modalities of test started in 1970s. Next, please. So here uh, there is some uh, pic, pic, uh, photograph that uh, uh, what is how a CT scan work. That is a motorized platform where patient is uh, moving uh, in the Z axis, and X-ray beam passes through the patient examination organ, and uh, data is uh, data acquisition performed from the opposite side. Next, please. So CT scan, uh, the tissue density measured by Hunsfield unit, and there are some uh, Hunsfield unit for bones, head, and that is unique for fluid. And there are different modalities of CT scan, that is helical and axial. Helical is a continuous CT scan where patient bed, that means uh, move in the Z axis, and machine takes in a helical manner. Next, please. The uses of CT scan, uh, actually uh, in the head injury, intracranial hemorrhage, ischemia, hydrocephalus, tumors, infection, head deformity. Next, please. In CT scan, there are some terminology which is important for um, student. That is, which one is isodense? Isodense means 
density is same to the brain tissue, especially the gray matter. And if the density is higher than that, that is called hyperdense. And if it is lower, so that is called hypod, uh, hypodense. Next, please. So how CT scan differentiated uh, in different stages? In, the, in this slide, in the top, there is a graphical picture. Uh, this, uh, there you see the in between gyrus, there are some empty space, which is called sulcus. In sulcus, CSF is, uh, um, CSF is show black in the CT scan and the gyrus show uh, isodense uh, pattern. But when there is some swelling of the gyrus due to edema or some other, uh, due to some other factor, the sulcus uh, space in the sulcus is decreased. Uh, there is uh, the CSF is black as it is hypodense. Uh, so CSF uh, space is not found in the uh, in the next uh, image. So next, please. By CT scan, we can differentiate different type of intracerebral hemorrhage. In the top right, you see there are two hemorrhages. One is extra uh, uh, dural or epidural hematoma, another is acute subdural. The extra dural uh, that is a lanceolate shape, outer and inner both side is convex, but uh, acute, uh, acute subdural <laughs> is a concavo convex pattern. But in CT scan, the trauma is identified very easily uh, as because bones is delineated very nicely and subarachnoid hemorrhage is also identified very nicely. The next, please. Uh, a chronic subdural hematoma uh, show the blood of different stages. In the third uh, uh, image, you see the um, hypodense uh, mass effect causes uh, shifting of the brain parenchyma and the effacement of the ventricle of the same side. Uh, next, please. Important in case of ischemic stroke, there is a mnemonic called DOSE. That T means territory. In the second image, you see the MCA uh, posterior vessel is involved. Next is ACE is hypodensity. E uh, O is edema. And S is shift. Shift means brain parenchyma is shifted from uh, due to pressure. And the E is evolution. This is very important. In this case, you see th there is a picture after 17 hours of ischemic hemorrhage, uh, ischemic stroke. Uh, uh, the ischemia is evoluted or converted to hemorrhagic one. Next, please. This is a uh, series of infection. In CT scan, we can find out infection. Uh, there is a mnemonic is meal. M is mass effect, and uh, that is uh, mass effect compresses the surrounding brain parenchyma, and it causes enhancement by contrast medium. As because in infection there is a uh, high vascularity at the marginal zone due to inflammation, and as because there is high vascularity, so contrast IV contrast media is more uptake in the high vascularity or inflammatory zone. That's why there is enhancement. The third one is appearance. That means in the top series, you see there is a multiple ring enhancing coalescing lesion. So that is a special appearance. So the lower one is the ring shape lesion. So appearance is important also. The last important one is location where it is located. Next, please. So advantage and disadvantage mm -hmm. of CT scan. So advantage, there is no claustrophobia like uh, MRI and good slice thickness. Uh, so it can give uh, more uh, excellent slice thickness than MRI. Best choice for bone, no ferromagnetic effect. We can use CT scan even in pacemaker, uh, more rapid. So it is a rapid uh, test. And disadvantage is radiation. 
but optimization is possible needs uh, sedation usually short sedation but bone artifact uh, causes a disadvantage especially posterior process scanning uh, poor tissue sensitivity in comparison to mri and reconstruction uh, recon is necessary for other other than hcl images uh, so we need some alternative of ct scan in some situation like ultrasonogram and mr scan image next please ct scan is not risk free uh, there are different literature they mention maybe one in 5000 head ct scan result a lethal malignancy especially younger child is more prone they are in greater risk and uh, there is a research work of pecan st study they show that how we can uh, clinically predict that which type of head trauma we can give ct scan or which type of head trauma we can escape ct scan so Pecan studies rather uh, than dictation, it can help in clinical decision making. This is clinically important. And next, please. So, in uh, regarding radiation, so as because the child have more rapidly dividing cell and they have the longer expectant of uh, expected life, so they are more potential to radiation injury. So they are more prone to radiation-induced cancer development. So many articles noted that the over-utilization of CT scan in past decades in all over the world, including the pediatric patient. Ready? Um, uh, next, please. So the in case of CT scan, our desired goal can dictate uh, that which type of CT scan we can perform. So we can optimize CT scan. Like there is an example when chi a child has sustained acute head trauma, what we want to see? We want to see fracture, we want to see pneumocephalus, we want to see any space occupying hematoma that may need emergency management. But the goal of this scenario is not necessarily a high resolution evaluation of brain parenchyma, but we need a low dose CT scan for emergency management. But if this is a vascular disease or demyelinating disease or a case of epilepsy, the MRI is a good alternative. So all cities in all CT scan, we have no need of high definition or high resolution CT scan. So we can reduce the radiation dose. Next, please. In hydrocephalus, why we do CT scan? First one for diagnosis. In uh, lower and left side, there is a uh, typical picture of hydrocephalus. So this hydrocephalus we can diagnose by a low dose uh, radiation uh, CT scan easily. Next. Uh, one is the evaluation of a patient after VP shunt. So evaluation can done by a low dose CT scan easily. But the third one, where the um, uh, compression of brain, brain parenchyma and the, uh, the brain uh, uh, parenchyma is very tight. So in the third one, we need a high resolution CT scan. Next, please. So this is a picture of an adult. We call, I call, uh, collect it from an article uh, where they show different radiation uh, and different picture. In low radiation dose, so the parenchyma is not seeing the last one very nicely. So, but the focused area, um, the um, uh, pathology is defining very nicely but rest of the parenchyma in low dose radiation is not defining very nicely. Next, please. So by reducing the radiation dose, 63% radiation can minimize. And uh, eye shield we can use for uh, reducing the uh, other side effect. Next, please. So in coronal image, if we know reconstruction, we can do it by uh, software 
so patient scanning time reduced another way of scanning time reduced by using low piece low piece uh, may reduce the scanning time next please uh, the important is craniofacial deformity like craniosynostosis uh, and ct scan in this case if we use uh, thick slides or a low dose so we cannot uh, get desired uh, quality image the upper image you see that is a good slice thickness that means a thin slice and high dose radiation but the lower one the uh, um, uh, thickness of slice is uh, very high and uh, uh, low dose radiation so scanning quality is uh, not up to mark so in case of craniofacial deformity we need a thin slice uh, otherwise obscure the detail next please software we need for three dimensional uh, reconstruction uh, by that way the scanning time may uh, reduced next please sedation and contrast is useful and we must uh, follow the standard guideline for sedation short term sedation and contrast medium next please there are some steps uh, of how we minimize the uh, radiation dose that first one is increase awareness next is al alternative imaging strategy uh, if necessary if possible ultrasonogram or mri and uh, order should be justified by clinical indication and establish radiation dose by child size age and by other uh, by indication or clinical indication next slide optimization done by some uh, by other way that means patient in the center of the gantry and reduce dose during projection or scout or topographic film and in pediatric uh, cases helical ct is better for uh, radiation reduction and reduce detector size may reduce some radiation and increase piece uh, must reduce the acquisition time uh, next please so scanning only uh, for indicated area and prepare a child friendly expeditious city environment next please so the golden rule which is worth repeating here is that the city scan is only an adjunct to clinical assessment and not the main source of management decision next please Thank you very much for kind hearing and I am sorry for technical uh, fault. Thank you very much for giving me a chance for say something. Thank you very much, uh, Sudipta, for your very comprehensive lectures on uh, CT scan. We have some questions on our uh, chat box. But maybe if you can stay with us at the end, we can try to solve as much as we can uh, these questions. And maybe we can continue. At the end, we'll have a good discussion about all these topics. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Norma Maria, most, please. Most welcome. Yes. OK, thank you. But thanks for your effort. And uh, thanks, Linda, for your help. Always good for us. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. And I think that's obviously radiation is a very serious uh, concern, especially in pediatric patients. And that's why they will describe black bone MRI sequence, which is a partial flip sequence, the black bone MRI sequence for craniofacial imaging um, as an alternative as, uh, of the CD scan to, you know, to wide the radiation risk. So again, thank you very, very much for the nice talk. We are now um, moving on to our next speaker, Dr. Ho Shi Li, who is currently working as an assistant professor of neuroradiology at the 
uh, Lyburn Hair Children Hospital and the University of Tennessee. He's involved in education, including teaching and development of new tools for medical education. And we are pleased to have him with us today to deliver a lecture on the magnetic resonance imaging of the brain and spine ill children. Dr. Hoji, welcome to the webinar. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. So you can just start your um, um, presentation and take your time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for, for the introduction. Um, the thing that I'm gonna to talk today is about the MRI of the brain and the spine in children. So it's a very, very long topic. So what I'm trying to do in these 20 minutes will be try to focus on how, uh, how the images are uh, evaluated as a, as a clinician. So the guys that want to, they're trained to be neurosurgeons and neurosurgeons already, they can see how we work in neuroradiology for that part. And then in the second part of the lecture, I'll just point out some specific things that we can do in advanced imaging uh, in the brain. So it can give you a, a, a look into the future of what we do and how can you do you use those techniques to actually help your patients. So I don't have any disclosure to report. So the goals for the first part are an overview of the MRI in neuroradiology and the importance and risk of contrast material. So first of all, this is the most basic part of the talk. Uh, these are the sequences that we are uh, going to base on anything to give a diagnosis to, to the neurosurgeons. So the first one, the left up corner, this is going to be a T1 uh, without contrast. So in this one, you can see how to recognize it. The cortex is dark. The white matter is bright and the CSF is dark. So that's your T1. T2, the cortex is bright. The white matter is dark and the CSF is bright. So it, they are basically opposite. Um, the third sequence that we use a lot is the T2 flare. So when we see this, a lot of people get confused, especially uh, at the beginning of their career, and they think this one is a T1, but it's not. If we analyze with detail, as I was telling you before, the cortex is bright, like the T2. The white matter is dark, like the T2. The only thing that is different is that the CSF is dark. So instead of being bright, so being dark, make it the whole picture to look darker. So that's why people get confused with T2 flare and uh, T1. So uh, how this work, this is basically a T2 with an image where we have the CSF suppressed. So the CSF is going to be dark. So that's why we have all the other similarities. Why is this important? Because it is easier to find or to evaluate lesions when you have a dark background rather than everything being bright. And finally, these are DWI images for diffusion. These are the ones that we specifically use to evaluate for acute infarction and also for uh, high cellularity tumors. And how it works, so it's also that this one will come from kind of the T2, but I don't want to go into details about the physics because of the time. But what we do on DWI is we're trying to evaluate diffusion. Diffusion is the movement of the molecules from one point to another point. So if you have a normal brain without any injury, no infarction, then that flow should be easy and fast. So you shouldn't have any restriction of the diffusion. So you see that brightness on, on the DWI. If you have an injury, like an acute infarction, that molecule, that water cannot flow easily because the tissue is dead. So it's gonna get stuck. So that's gonna be a restricted diffusion. In a restricted diffusion, you'll see the DWI images much, much brighter compared to the rest of the brain. And you will see the ADC map that I'm not showing here, but I'll show later, that is very dark. Similarly, it's gonna happen with high cellularity tumors. Why? because you have a lot of cells. So those cells are gonna uh, not let that flow of molecules to be easy. They're gonna take a longer time. So the diffusion of that molecules, the diffusion of that uh, 
um, water is going to be restricted. It's going to be slower. So it's going to have also very bright on DWI and very dark on ADC map. So that's the basics of this lecture for the part of the brain. A couple of examples. We have a three-year-old with post cardiac arrest and head trauma. As uh, Dr. Sudipta said before, this CT is very good for, for, the, for the calvarium to see the bone, but it's not as great for parenchyma as it's the MRI. So right now, if I see this, uh, it's, it's completely normal. I'm not completely sure, but it doesn't jump to me that it's something abnormal. If we have the MRI, we can see that in the deep gray nuclei, everything is very, very bright, and we see restricted diffusion. Bright on DWI, dark on ADC. Be why? Because there is an infarction of those structures, so the cells are dead. You have a normal flow of the molecules of the water, so basically you have restricted diffusion, and restricted diffusion shows as bright DWI signal and dark ADC. Uh, this is another case. This is a patient with a lesion over here that we cannot describe very well. It's kind of oval, and then you have some stuff surrounding it, maybe edema. You get an MRI, and you can see, okay, there is some edema over here, bright on T2, bright on T2 flare. Post-contrast enhancement, you see a little bit of enhancement over here. Diffusion images, you see it bright here and dark on ADC. So, this is not an infarction, this is not a tumor, but it's, it's having diffusion restriction because you have a problem with the pus. So in, in, in MRI, you can have uh, restricted diffusion also if you have pus. And sometimes some people think it's because of, uh, of the radicals, some people think it's because of, the, uh, of, of some reaction that are having in the, in, in the abscess. But you can see it over there and you can see how that pus is going into a ventricle, so it becomes a ventriculitis. Another case to see the parenchyma, again, check the cortex, dark, dark, dark in T1, and we can see something dark, similar here in the, in the white matter of the frontal lobe, similar here also on the left side. And if we go to the T2, it's the same, it's bright as a cortex, and this look exactly the same. So it's a patient with seizures. So what is going on here? This is basically gray matter heterotopia. Really quickly, I wanted to talk also about uh, the uh, spine. So this is a CT image. You can see now the MRI, how we can evaluate the uh, intraspinal structures. So what I'm pointing here on the, uh, on the slide, this is just a disc. But you can see here, all the things are bright. This is just a CSF. Remember T2, bright. This is a T2 sequence, CSF is bright. These little things over here, these are the nerve roots. So it's very easy for, for us to evaluate the, the, uh, the spinal cord, the, the spinal canal itself, the, and, the, and the nerves. Why is this helpful? For example, this is again, same thing. This is a T2 sequence. Uh, here, and we can see how that this is having uh, herniation and is causing this narrowing of the of the uh, of the spinal canal. We cannot really see CSF within it. This is another case. This is a normal one. I just want to explain what we can see. So we're seeing again in the lumbar area. These are the discs. What I'm pointing with the arrow. You can see a CSF is bright and you can see the, the nerves, they look fine. So this is an axial view about this level, at L4, L5, and we can see the roots, you can see the disc, as I was pointing in the prior slide. Remember, the roots are exiting at the level of the disc, so if this is an L4 disc, this is gonna be L4 nerve roots exiting. If you have a, herniation in this area over here, it actually going to affect the L5 nerve roots, the ones that are going down. Uh, and then we have all the other areas. This changes a little bit, especially if you're in the cervical region or in the lumbar region, but um, we can get into that in a, in a separate lecture. It's more about uh, the spine 
and, and problems about it. We can do also T1 uh, sequences like this one, and we can do uh, T1 post contrast images. So in this case, you can see here T1 pre contrast, the nerve roots are dark, there's no enhancement, of course, because we have an injecting. Now you inject, and now you have enhancement here of the roots. We see on the axial images, and we can see those nerve roots have enhancement. That's this is a case of Julian Barre, and these patients uh, start having some problem with the movement of their legs, and it gets progressive. And imaging wise, this is how we see them. We see with enhancement. Okay. Um, now I'm going to show you about uh, the uh, other sequences that we use. Uh, we discussed this is a T1. This is actually uh, it's labeled it as a T2, but uh, this is actually the steer. And this one over here is the, uh, the T2. How I know that? Because steer is basically suppression of the fat. So I can see in the T1, there is fat in the subcutaneous tissue. So if I go here and I still see fat, that is, has to be the T2, it cannot be the steer. In this one, I don't see the fat, so this is a steer, so this is mislabeled. Uh, but uh, when we try to evaluate these sequences, we can say, for example, hey, there is something here that it shouldn't be bright, right? Because it should be CSF, 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 and you have some heterogeneous signal here. In this one, you have bright, 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 and there's some heterogeneous signal, and see how the the roots are moved anteriorly. And then in the steer sequence also. Steer is also good because it suppresses the fat, but also helps you see the bone marrow signal. If it's bright, sometimes it's because you have a fracture over it. So let's see the axial images on the T2. See this collection over here is pushing the nerve roots. So there is something here on the T1. This should be dark. Remember, CSF is dark and it's bright and it's pushing. And this is not something uh, with contrast. So this is because the patient had a subacute uh, hemorrhage in the spine. That's why there's a collection over here that is pushing. If we only had the T2, we could get confused and say, oh, this is only CSF. But now that we have the T1, we can tell, OK, there is an issue over there. Important things about MRI in general, be careful what is compatible with MRI and what is not, what is safe or not. Not only the structures or the things that you bring in for your patient, but also you and your team. If you have a pacemaker, if you have uh, any kind of device, you can have an injury if you go to the MRI machine. Can we uh, scan patients with the uh, uh, pacemaker? Yeah. But we have to follow specific protocols and specific sequences. What's another important thing about it, about MRI? As Dr. Sudita was talking, if you have a long acquisition compared to CT, this takes longer. Uh, it could take five minutes to get one sequence. Then the patient can move, especially pediatric patients. So it's you're going to get artifacts. You have patients with braces. We have different kind of uh, artifacts that can give you blooming artifact, like in this case, and, and can damage the images. Contrast for MRI, we use it usually for infection, for mass, for vessels. We have to be very careful about nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, allergic reaction, and iatrogenic causes. Nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, what is this? It's basically, um, the gadolinium get dissociated uh, within the body and it start going to tissue where it shouldn't go and it stays there. It doesn't, don't get, doesn't get excreted. So it can affect the skin and can affect other organs. So when this happened, this happened when you have patient with a significant kidney injury. So it can be because it's a severe acute kidney injury so it's not only for chronic kidney injury. And also if you have a chronic kidney injury where the, uh, the GFR is less than 60, that's our cutoff as radiologists. There are a lot of publications, most of the cases, 
all the cases are actually below uh, 30 of GFR. So just keeping in mind, if you have a patient with a kidney injury being cute, acute or chronic, just talk with your radiologist and he or she will help you decide if it's a risk or not. And we can do other kind of tests. We can do it without contrast and, uh, and try to avoid uh, problems. So take home points for the first part. MRI is excellent for parenchyma. Everything and everyone has to be MRI compatible and be careful with kidney injury. Uh, talk with your radiologist. Now, uh, I only have a few minutes and I'm just gonna talk about very uh, interesting things that we can do with MRI, especially on the brain. Um, uh, I'm not gonna talk about it too much. I'm just gonna show you a few pictures so you know what you can do, what you can ask your radiologist, and maybe it can be a topic for a future lecture. So for example, you can have color and isotropy maps. Um, so remember I was telling you, <clears throat> when you have diffusion and you have the movement of the molecules, uh, you can actually take that movement and make a, uh, in a mathematical algorithm, put them in color and tell you where the fibers go through. So in this case, there's a tumor here. You can see it with, uh, it's enhancing, but we see that there's a little band over here. So the neurosurgeon asked me, hey, can I resect the whole thing? Or is this is a problem? How is all this? I do a map. See, you can see all the fibers, and I can see that there are fibers going through this. So he went and resect this other part, and he left this. So we didn't have any problems with the uh, functionality of the patient. What else can we do? DTI. So the DTI is similar to the anisotropy maps, but we specifically target one. Um, track. So in this case, I'm targeting the cortical spanner track. So I know that this lesion is not actually affecting the cortical spanner track, it's just pushing. Okay. We can use it also, the maps and the, and the DTI after callosotomy. So you want to know if you took out all the fibers or not, get an MRI, see how this is dissected, and then I can also put a seat over here and see, okay, where all the fibers that I select here will go. And they're going here, here, they're going here, but they are not going to the other side. So this is a successful uh, consultant. Functional MRI, there is a change on the brain and parts of the brain, depending what part of your body you are using for language, movement, or anything. That change on the, uh, taking that amount of blood, there's more blood going over there, they're taking nutrients, that makes a change in the signal. And we can use that change to differentiate from the rest of the brain and say, this is the part that is moving the hand, this is the part that is moving the, the feet. So we can even do it in pediatric patients with patients sedated. So the patient doesn't have to move himself. Like you can see me over there, I'm doing the movement for the foot of the patient, and we can actually get the signal and I can tell you where the foot it is similar for the hands. So even those advanced images can be used with children. We use it all the time and it helps a lot for the surgical outcome and the planning for, for these kids. Uh, finally, this is IMRI, interoperative MRI. You can see this is in the OR room. They already took all the instruments out and we're moving the magnet from another room to the OR room to take a scan while the patient has the head open. This is the image of the IMRI. You can see it's still open. They already did the removal of the tumor and they can tell, yep, yeah, it's good. We're done with the surgery, you can just close. Or if there was a tumor, I can tell, hey, there's a still tumor over there and they can go back instead of rescheduling for another surgery. Okay, uh, well, take on points that I said, you can use, uh, uh, MRI for following the white matter tracks, helpful for callosotomy and tumor surgery. And functional MRI, it can be also sedated, especially for our, our little kids. Hopefully it's helped you. And this is my email. If you have any questions, uh, I will stay at the end uh, to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation.
Thank you very much, uh, Georgie Diaz, for this comprehensive lecture on MRI, spinal, brain, and how to uh, functional. Uh, thanks for being with us and uh, gratitude for wait until the end and do you do the question at the end to try to solve all the questions. And uh, on MRI, we need anesthetize the patients, in some cases, or most of the cases. And please introduce uh, Ana Laura Normaria. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Hoshi, for the very nice lecture. I'm now very pleased to introduce Dr. Anna Laura Latore Elkintara. She will be, um, she's an anesthesiologist in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro at the Brain Institute, Paulo Nimeyer. It's a pleasure to have her today with us to discuss this very important aspect of, uh, you know, uh, anesthesia in children, particularities in neurosurgery. Dr. Anna, thank you very, very much for joining us today. We are looking forward to listening to your wonderful lecture that will that is certainly very important uh, for us. And obviously, like Professor Nelsi has already mentioned, that this is the basic thing that we need to see in um, in getting in you know, a scan. So thank you very much. The floor is all yours now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank and congratulate all the ISPN team, especially Dr. Neil Cizanon, who helped me build the concept of multidisciplinarity to the construction of neuroscience. Today, oh, sorry. Today, uh, we are going to talk about the particularities of neuropediatric anesthesiology. Uh, sadly, not everyone has the idea that child is not a small adult. There is enormous variation within the pediatric population, an important characteristic of our approach to each age group. I would like to uh, I would like to understand that these are characters, not difference. Physiological and anatomical knowledge give us the confidence to choose the, and design the anesthesia management. Uh, yes, we need to design your planning. I would like to address this topic by systems. No, first, the more important system, the respiratory system, you have the relative macroglossia, cranial displacement of the layering, epiglot short and oblong, short neck, increase the airways resistance, alveolar immaturity, drive hypoxia, hypercarbia from preschooler zone, and it's very important. The cardiovascular system, we have decreased ventricular compliance, Cardiac output depend for heart rate as sympathetic neurosystem immaturity until six months, an important relationship to the age and cardiac output and cardiac blood flow is very different. The anesthesiology must be aware to the metabolism and contemporary control and especially cerebral, uh, cerebral metabolisms, which we always have to aim the optimizing cerebral blood flow and cerebral oxygen consumption. There are different characters with each and age group. For example, in premature, do you have uh, a cerebral blood flow in only 40 to 42 per 100 grams per minute? Uh, the oxygen consu consumption in preschoolers, you no, know, in childhood, is the five to five point two milliliters per hundred grams. And now, with the advance of neuroscience, the concept of anesthesia has become broad. And the first step to planning your anesthesia do have to consider main points like uh, preoperative discussion, soft induction adequate oxygenation and cerebral perfusion, brain relaxation, soft awakening, you no, know, and a neuroradiological ICU. In general, we can divide the anesthesia in conscious sedation, you no, know, 
que consists of responding to verbal or tactile stimulation, or and with no airway intervention, and the general anesthesia. There is a complete analgesia, immobility, and intervention in the airway. And why did we choose the general anesthesia for a pediatric population? When we will put the pros and cons on the scale, risk of brain injury and the security, we can see that we can better manipulate the control of cerebral blood flow, auto-regulation, bleeding, as well the airway safety. Preparation and planning for neuroradiological procedures are the same of those performing the operating room. It's not different. It's important to have a specialized professional both in pediatric and neurological population, lead, leading to a lower incidence of complication. This image both presents an induction and an awakening in the MRI. Over the last 10 years, the Brain Institute in Rio de Janeiro has executed 8,624 8, MRI with anesthesia, and then those were 75% were children. The high rate of complication in the pediatric population is the management and uh, airway management. And we saw another slide, we have the anatomical and physiological particularities predisposed to a hypoxia and bronchospasm. At the end of this, the neurosurgical pathology and craniofacial deformities increase the probability of this intercurrence. In this slide, we have some images where we can easily visualize some cases: the hydrocephalus, the cranial synostose in the post, uh, syndromic airways like a Moebius syndrome or a Pierre Robin sequence. Another important aspect is adequate monitoring, implying that we can adapt adult monitors to the pediatric population. It's not only wrong, but we can add risk. Why you will believe uh, we are monitoring? We may be disguising any real deviation. For example, the use, the use of improper side of oximeter sensor may give false results or brain function monitor with adult sensor or without proof of age. Most of the brain uh, function sensor, that is a processed uh, electroencephalogram, are based on the reading of the alpha waves. They are detected from one year old. For more efficient to, to control the temperature, you, you should use esophage sensor at a cephalic position, instead skin or rectal sensors. This is an example for a correct setting of the monitor, the sensors. Adequate cerebral function sensor, adequate oximeter sensor, and millimeter duress is collected. It's important to fully comprehend the blood and fluids management during procedures. You should use balanced solutions. You must calculate the blood volume and the maximum bleeding volume for each patient. We know that anemia is an isolate marker for increased perioperative mortality. Is this is, is that most important to establish institutional protocols for the replacement of the blood complement, transfusional strategies, and albumin use. Laboratory follow-up, remember that we have access to adequate lab collection tubs with less than one milliliter for the pediatric population. The concept of multidisciplinarity allows us to understand that the need, the interaction, and continuity in the post-operative care, monitoring and specialized ICU, uh, temperature control, surgical stress response control, ICP, and the blood volume. We must keep in mind that the outcome depends on both choice, the technique, and drugs. 
Personalization is very important. Takes the account of metabolization and association with another pathology. The brain tissue metabolic rate, oxygen, cerebral blood flow, autoregulation, reactivity to CO2, and ICP. In this table, uh, we can see that the most anesthetic decreased cerebral blood flow, except for ketamine. Just as most decreased oxygen consumption for except for ketamine and some opioids. This metatomidine uh, appears that only anesthetic is that acts to decrease the cerebral autoregulation and the CO2 reactivity. Regarding the ICP, most uh, seem to decrease and except to ketamine, we seem to increase the, the, the ICP and the opioids, which do not seem to change their level. We cannot forget the importance of the psychological impact, not only for the child, but the parents. Uh, it's not always uh, possible to administrate the drugs, the pre-anesthetic drugs to the neurosurgical patients. Everything we can do to minimize, mitigate, and facilitate this process must be done. It's up to the medical team to understand the importance, they will humanize this process, and they must strive with the institution to make it possible. Turning to a playful, playful moment, bringing the presence of the family closer and building the confidence uh, in the child. You can see here uh, some examples of how we experience humanizing preoperative moments with children. I hope uh, we can keep in mind. Sorry. Uh, I hope we can keep in mind these key points, uh, like a multidisciplinary team, knowledge of physiological and anatomic characteristics, cerebral blood volume and cerebral blood flow, adequate monitoring, neurological ICU, neuroanesthesiology, and human eyes. My goal here is to bring awareness of importance of neuropediatric anesthesiology like a medical specialty. And thanks for all. Thank you very much, Ana Laura, for the very interesting lectures on pediatric anesthesia. It's not usual for our mm -hmm. webinars to have this interdisciplinarity, but I think it's more and more important to share knowledge and to know. We have minutes for several questions, and maybe we can start for the end to be the beginning the lectures, just to do differently. Uh, you talk about uh, blood transfusion. Uh -huh. When you advise your surgeon, your neurosurgeon, that you are at limit or on blood transfusion, is one volume of blood transfusion, two volume for the child, or you have other parameters that you, you call for your neurosurgeon and tell him maybe uh, we have risk for this uh, point of no return or some difficulties on uh, keeping the child well and alive? Mm, we need to... Um... To think in the pathology, the principal pathology, and the, the volume of, of the, the bleeding. And it, I think it's more important. Um, it's sorry, uh, it's important to, to evaluate, evaluate the the, the um, hemodynamic and uh, not only the laboratory vol uh, volumes it's not so important but it's the um, is the ed the pathology the hemodynamic alterations and the volume in the in bleeding Um, actually, I think that we should also add a question about the auto-transfusion techniques in uh, pediatric neurosurgery. So there is some data about this auto-transfusion technique. So uh, if anyone of you wants to add a little bit more about the auto-transfusion uh, here and how, what's your view and how do you see it? 
or is very in, in the pediatric population is not consent about the out, out transfusion. It, now, nowadays, we we can try to do protocols to this, but not literature for this. Exactly. There was, a, you know, some paper written by, you know, uh, late Professor Jimenez. I was, I've been talking about her, David Jimenez, uh, who has just, you know, left us for good. So there was a paper on, um, uh, I think he had uh, written something on uh, his experience in cranial surgery that he used this autotrophic technique. So it was something of my interest that I was asking uh, whether it's your experience about it. So like you have rightly mentioned, so there's, there is one thing. I think Dr. Brown wanted to add something. Jorge, I have a question for you, a very practical issue. What are your thoughts with regard to the risks of ionizing radiation in children? We identify sort of two groups, those that get lots of images and really try and avoid CT versus those that are not likely to have more images and have less of an aversion to CT, but that's by no means the right answer. You've thought about this. What precautions do you give to practitioners that are treating children with the potential for needing imaging over time with regard to use of CT and MR? Uh, that's an excellent question. And that's something that I, I get asked all the time. Um, and the first thing that I said is, we are trying to work on that specific patient on the benefits and risk. So um, sometimes a lot of people are very concerned about the radiation. I, they, don't take the image that they need to solve the question. And actually that's that's worse because then you start missing some stuff and then and, and then when you finally have it, then it's a problem with the, for the patient. So there are different things that we can do. One is MRI has evolved a lot. So for example, these patients that we have to do only one CT for a trauma, I will say, go ahead and do CT. Don't think it twice, just go ahead. If it's a patient that is for a BP shunt that you're gonna follow every six months, then maybe the first one or in the ER, if you have to do something extremely quickly, uh, do your CT, that's not gonna cause a significant damage. But if you're gonna be following this patient, um, talk with your radiologist. So whenever this patient comes for it, we can just do a very specific sequence in the MRI that won't need uh, anesthesia because it won't be, it will be very short. We can do it like really fast in, in, in minutes and take just information of the size of the ventricle instead of spending five minutes on each sequence to give you information of the parenchyma or the extra spaces or other stuff. We can just focus on the size of the ventricles and do it like in, in a couple of minutes and then the patient is is out and then we save the uh, radiation and, and we save the need for anesthesia in, in little kids. So it's, it's, always, it's, it's always possible. It just needs to be a little bit of communication. If it's in the ER setting, um, if those protocols have not been placed in the past, I will just recommend go for the CT uh, and have a safe, um, uh, safe communication with the, with the with the patient, the family, and, and the radiologist. And then after that, it's gonna, if it's gonna be multiples, then try to, to get a plan with that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. <clears throat> there is a couple of questions for you on the chat box, George. Uh, one of them is about artifacts. How can you reduce or uh, eliminate the artifacts for metallic uh, issue like external regulate valve or cochlear implant? There is a specific software or uh, is a question of acquisition for this image? Another excellent question. Yes, um, there are different things and it depends on what the implant is we have to do uh, follow specific protocols and specific SAR levels uh, for depending on what we are, uh, the acquisition we're getting. Um, some of these, for example, auditory um, devices, they can be removed. Some of them, 
they cannot be removed and they have to be wrapped by ENT before going to the in the to the magnet. And some of them uh, there's no problem, and some of them you cannot put them in the in the magnet at all. So it's very variable. So when you get them, these patients, the ones that we can get into the magnet, they are going to have significant um, significant metallic artifact, regardless what we do. There are some specific things that can be done, but usually those things, those sequences are still in development. They are approved for research, but are not FDA approved to, to, for, for the scanner. So it, it depends on if, if it can be put it into a category of a research or not. But having a specific sequences that they actually remove the artifact uh, of motion artifact, or in this case, uh, the uh, uh, metallic artifact, it, they, they don't, they are not reliable, available for everybody. Uh, this is something that's gonna come in the future for sure, uh, especially with uh, all the movement with artificial intelligence, especially in radiology, we can do a lot of things to try to compensate for images that, so part of the images that we don't get secondary to artifact, uh, it could be from motion or it could be from, from metallic artifact. So they will start coming, I think, in, in the next few years. But for now, uh, there's not something that you can say, hey, why don't you do this, this specific sequence for to avoid the metallic uh, artifact? Some of them are going to be less, some of them are going to be more, but none of them is going to reduce completely to, to be able to see that brain normally. Elsie, may I pose a question to Marcelo? Marcelo, can you comment on the use of intraoperative ultrasound? Do you get called to the operating room to read and uh, review the ultrasound done by surgeons in your center, or do you train them, or do they interpret all their own and do all their own? Maybe you could make some comments about what your view is of intraoperative ultrasound. Sure. So, uh... The places I work at, uh, we radiologists do not do, uh, so it's it's funny. We do the intraoperative ultrasounds for uh, abdominal surgeries, but not for uh, neurosurgeries. So uh, neurosurgeries, those are uh, specific to the uh, neurosurgeons. Uh, but this is just the way the, the places I work have uh, established themselves. What do you think is the best way for a neurosurgeon to learn to get very comfortable with using intraoperative ultrasound? How long does it take? So, uh, I guess the the main issue with ultrasound is uh, understanding. It, it, I guess neurosurgeons do have uh, great. Uh, understanding obviously of the anatomy. So I'd say that the, the greatest uh, difficulty is actually uh, handling the equipment. So uh, what we call uh, like the button, buttonology, button technique. So understanding uh, what you can do to get the, the best image. Uh, so what modes are and, uh, and how to properly, what you can insonate, what you can use as an acoustic window or not. Uh, so I guess this is the, the, the hardest part and this, you don't need to actually do intraoperative. You don't need to be in a very uh, hard spot to train this. You can do this with the ultrasound with other things. Uh, I guess that in my opinion, a, a intensive training, maybe uh, two weeks uh, on how to actually manipulate the ultrasound. I wouldn't say an anatomy, but rather understanding the equipment itself that would be more than enough. The thing is, then you'd have to keep it um, in your head. Like it's something that, as you I'm sure know that, that if you stop doing it, then you'll probably forget about it. But I guess that two weeks uh, of like doing it maybe every day, uh, that should be enough to accommodate most people to actually handling the equipment fairly well. 
Oh, well, I, I just wanted to add a little things uh, regarding the artifact topic uh, that we have been talking about. I think there are a, a few couple of things that we need to uh, be aware of, like including the Mac bash. You know, there was a very old um, case report I have read that uh, in, in which they have described that uh, due to the Mac effect, there was a Mac band that was misinterpreted as a dense fracture on an X-ray. So this is something that we need to um, uh, have an idea about another uh, important point in pediatrics. And I think the myelination pattern uh, in the MRI that is important, I think that we need to take think about and to have an, a little idea about most of the time we don't even take care of the tables this because we already know what we are seeing, what we are watching. But for I think for the attendee point of view, it is something of importance that there are a little, there are a few differences in the pediatric age group there are like um, there's, a mile, there's a milestone of myelination and obviously you should know about when the future that being closed and when the fortunalities are being closed so this is these are a few things that i really just want to add from the point of view of students and young trainees thank you Nora maria uh I have a question to Dr. Sudipta. Uh, it's important to decrease radiation on CTs. Uh, it's uh, real on the textbooks, real on the papers. I would like to know if it was easy to decrease the radiation in your protocol in your day-by-day -day life, because we feel uh, some resistance to implement some protocols. I'd like to know your step by step and if you achieve already a uh, decrease of acquisition CT scan for the children with uh, less radiation in your day by day work. Thanks for the uh, question. Uh, what in my center, what happened if we send any uh, kids for doing a CT scan and we uh, give a note to do it in the pediatric protocol. Our uh, technician, that means city technician, they uh, reduce the radiation dose. And I think this is uh, helpful for patient. And uh, what is uh, we learn from our seven step, that means awareness build up in the city technician also. So they can help to reduce the uh, radiation, uh, radiation. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, some of, uh, just remind the audience that MCQs are available on the chat box. And after we close the meeting, we will have some remaining time for you to fill the questions. Don't worry about uh, the time done. Don't need to rush on it now. Uh, we have remaining questions on our audience uh, to Marcelo Strauss. Uh, two questions. It's possible to correlate ventricular megaly with the nerve uh, seat uh, diameter. And the second, some risk for the neonate uh, to do ultrasound is the question from our audience, Marcelo. Thanks. Okay, so I'll start from the end. So regarding risks for ultrasound for, uh, on units, the there is a... Uh, so the way ultrasound works, it, it emits the ultrasound wave, the wave hits the tissue, uh, and it in turn makes a response, which emits another wave back to the ultrasound, and uh, the ultrasound uh, gets this information back. So there is transfer of energy and therefore there can be uh, uh, heating issues. So you can get uh, warmer by doing ultrasound. Uh, this is not an issue with uh, medical, uh, so imaging equipments. Uh, there are parameters which you can use in order to reduce this, which is called the mechanical index. Uh, but to my knowledge, I, I haven't, I, I do not know of any, um, uh, known issue with this. So we use, uh, at the places I work, we use ultrasound for newborns, preterms, extreme preterms uh, indiscriminately. Uh, there, this is not considered uh, a, um, 
a contraindication for the, the exam. But the only thing I can see is it heating. There are techniques that heat that the will generate more energy and less energy. So, but either way, this is not an, an issue. Uh, there has been some advances on what is called elastography, which is uh, a, a modality of ultrasound in which you measure the stiffness of the tissue. Uh, and there, while there has been some uh, scientific um, interrogation about the effects of this on uh, neonatal brains, uh, there are a couple of researches uh, that have already been published with uh, no no uh, with adverse outcomes on this as well. Uh, and the first question was about nerve sheet. I'm assuming these are um, these, the person is talking about uh, um, ocular ultrasound. And <clears throat> so, assuming this is what you're talking about. Uh, in my institution, we rarely do uh, nerve sheet ocular ultrasound, uh, but there are published um, literature on this uh, with what would be the normal and abnormal uh, measurements of the nerve sheet in order for you to uh, assess intracranial hypertension. But I, uh, in my institution, the institution that I work at, we almost never use this. We rely much more on um, V mode measurements of so the, the, the particular uh, measurements that I talked before and um, Doppler ultrasound for this evaluation. Thank you, Marcelo. There is other questions from our audience for you, uh, George Diaz. Uh, about anisotropy and DTI, this require a specific software or is uh, only a different acquisition for the neurosurgeon that ask for uh, to his uh, neuroradiologist? Um, yes. So uh, for the maps, for the anisotropy maps, the one with the color that you see all the all the tracks and all the fibers in general. That one, some of the magnets, they will just send it automatically to your to the pack system. You don't have to do anything. Some some MRIs, if they're a little, usually if they're a little older, um, they won't send it automatically. So the technologists or the radiologists will have to go in and, um, and just change a little things and do it over there. It doesn't take a long time, maybe like 10 minutes and then send it to the back so you can see it. Um, the one that I show with the uh, corpus callosotomy and there was a, a, a cut over there, that one also can be done in the magnet. Uh, you have to do the seating over there. So it's uh, that one also doesn't need an extra uh, stuff. The tractography, like if you see the TTI when I show the cortical spinal tracks going through, that is a different one that needs a specific software. There are many vendors. Um, what they, what you have to do is send those images from your machine that technology, send the images from the MRI machine to this other computer instead of sending it to the packs. And then in this other computer, you can do all the, all the work and the statistics to, to do the, the, the DTI and everything. Similar for the functional MRI. You have to send somewhere else to work on it. Um, and so, yeah, it, it depends on how the level that you want to do. Thank you. Another question from the audience is about uh, contrast. Uh, in your routine, did you ask for the renal function examination before the contrast? Uh, on the same uh, question, uh, it's better that the neurosurgeon request for a contrast before and after contrast, or is a decision from the radiologist to inject the contrast or not, if he's able to give the diagnosis without? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's excellent. So about the contrast, no, I don't, I don't request uh, the, the threatening or GFR in my outpatients. In patients, usually they already have it as a part of the workup that they're doing. Uh, so I can check it over there. In an outpatient, I will only request it if they say they have some kind of kidney injury. 
And usually there's already a communication with the clinician if there's a kidney injury and they want a contrast. Um, so that's for, for, the, for the thing. And I, I think most of the institutions are the same. They don't, for outpatient, they don't request for you to have a, a, a creatinine or a GFR uh, drawn before the, the imaging, um, only if there's any, any specific concern. An inpatient already, you have it. For uh, the other question is like, if, if the radiology decide or the clinician decides, um, for the inpatients, the clinician, uh, in this case, the neurosurgeon, order it, and they decide if they want with and without. Because they're pediatric patients, uh, um, we see those protocols before they, they do the exam. So I'll check what they're doing. And if I feel that that patient didn't need contrast, I'll call the neurosurgeon and, and tell him, hey, I think I, we don't need it and, and we'll discuss about it. Or the other way, if there's no contrast, I need contrast, I'll give them a call and, and we'll discuss it and, and do it. Um, in the outpatient setting, uh, it, it's usually kind of trying to do the same, but is the, the neurosurgeon who actually ask for it uh, or not, put it, give it or not. And if it's, if for some reason it makes uh, better, better sense to do it the other way, now we'll give them a call and try to, and we, we change it. Um, so, yep. Thank you. The last question I pick up, it was to uh, Marcel Ustaus uh, and ultrasound. Did you believe that in a short term, the ultrasound can replace the CT scan with uh, 3D to the preoperative diagnosis and about antenatal diagnosis of craniosynostosis? Uh, a part of a syndromic one that is we can see more other anomalies associated from the single shooter closure. Did you believe that in a short term we can have antenatal diagnosis with uh, ultrasound? Okay, so for the 3D ultrasound, uh, 3D ultrasound is uh, something that is very, it's been out for uh, quite some time now. Uh, but still, it is there are very few places that actually do 3D ultrasound. It's uh, it has not gained uh, a momentum, I guess, in, in in clinical practice. Uh, there are a few reasons for this. One of them, it is really expensive. So the transducer uh, that we use for the 3D ultrasound, it the, it is very very expensive. There are a few types of them. One, of, some of them are mechanic, in which there is like a little motor inside of it, and it makes the the transistor the, the crystals work this way. Uh, and these break very often. So beyond the, uh, uh, they're expensive and they can break. And the other ones are the ones that have a whole matrix of crystals, and these are even more expensive. So this is the the they're not that accessible. They're very, uh, they're very nice uh, papers on this, on using volumetric 3D ultrasound to do um, evaluation of the whole uh, ventricular um, uh, volumes and even uh, trying to match them uh, slice-wise with um, MRs or CTs. But uh, this will take, I, I, I imagine this will take, it, it won't be soon. It's still very expensive. And uh, I don't think that, the the cost will outweigh the the benefit for this at least in in short term because you need to remember that um, there there aren't that many places that have la very large um, uh, neonative intensive care units that would justify such a a cost for for this very specific uh, tool um, and I'm sorry the other question was on. Oh, uh, prenatal diagnosis of uh, of chronostenosis. I'm I'm not the right person to talk about that. I do not do um, prenatal ultrasound, so uh, I'll pass on that one. I'm sorry. Perfect, dear. Perfect. There is a question for all the audience. Did you indicate uh, pediatric radiology books for the audience uh, that include ultrasound? Uh, yeah, I, 
I need to get the name of it. One second. On my mind, I remember Bar Barkovic, but I'm not sure that there is a pediatric radiology uh, on Barkovic. Did you have some indication, Roger Diaz, Egypta, uh, Marcelo? Actually, uh, the head of my my department, Dr. Asim Chowdhury, he is a neuroradiologist. He wrote a book that is called, I think, Pediatric Neuroradiology. And I really like it because it's, it's concise, so it's not a huge book. It's something that somebody can read, and and if you have any issues, you can go and, and see the specific chapter. Uh, it's an excellent book. Um, the books from Barkovich, that's that's going to be an excellent, amazing book. It's going to be pretty long too uh, for for neuroradiology in general. Um, so. I think if you want something that is more focused, if, if you are, if you want to just have an idea of everything and, and try to see most of pathologists, that book from Chowdhury is, is excellent. Chowdhury? Okay. There's another book from uh, Dr. Kevin Moore, uh, which is available in, in, in the form of, you know, an e-book very commonly, you know, you can search for it on uh, on Google Books as well. So, uh, do you have any idea? Do you, do you would you recommend this book by Dr. Kevin Moore? Is a question or a statement, Norma? Norma, yeah. it's a question. It's a question, uh, Madam. There, I see a book by Dr. Kevin Moore. So I, I'm not sure uh, because I had uh, just a very brief reading um, of, of, of this book, but I'm just asking if you would like to recommend this book on neuroradiology by Dr. Gavin Moore, because it is you know, quite commonly available on the, on the website and many people do have the PDF of that um, book of neuroradiology by Dr. Gavin Moore. So I just want to know your recommendation about regarding the book by Dr. Gavin Moore. It's a question. <laughs> Thank you, Norma Maria. You talk so fast, my dear, that we need to do a little bit extra effort. <laughs> uh, I'm not familiar with that book, so sorry. I I, I can't help with that. But uh, well, the one I have here for oh, I'm sorry, uh, from Kenny, just to say that the one that I I, I have for uh, ultrasound is it's just a general ultrasound book, which is called uh, it's written by Siegel. Uh, uh, I. If you but if you want, I have um, like ultrasound um, ultrasound folder with lots of um, papers, which I think are uh, uh, good for residents, for my residents. And if anyone wants, they can just shoot me an email, and I'll I'll share the the drive uh, link with the the papers. I'll just write. My, is there any way where I can write my email? I'm gonna check here. Okay, Let's hope this works. Thanks, Marcelo. Uh, some other comments or additional information before closing this section? I remind everyone that uh, we have the ISPN meeting, annual meeting in Chile next October, and I hope uh, you can join us there. Marcelo just shared the email. Uh, dear Linda, can you put uh, the Marcelo Strauss email uh, for the audience? Because I'm not sure that is available for all of us or only for the- uh, yeah, I will put it there. Thank you very much, Linda. And uh, maybe final words uh, from each one of you. Ana Laura, you are on the top of my screen. And you are muted, dear. Ah, no. okay. Uh, I, I think only the, 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 the idea of multidisciplinarity and the collaboration and the, the need to, to improve this action, this multidisciplinarity. Thank you very much, dear. Uh, George Diaz. Yes. So 
first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Always happy to, to help out. I think uh, what it was mentioned, multidisciplinary conferences and uh, interaction with departments is uh, the most important thing. We can all help each other and help learn about stuff. And uh, that's the only way to actually make it safer uh, for our patients. So. Thank you, George. Sudita Kumar. Thanks, ISPN Authority, for organizing this nice learning session. And ISPN actually is a great family all over the world for pediatric neurosurgeon. And I am fortunate that ISPN give me a chance to say something in uh, today's session. And actually, I learn more than I say uh, in this session. And thanks again. ISPN authority and others attendee for uh, this session. Thank you very much, Sudipta. Marcelo? Yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for everyone who was uh, watching us. Congratulations to all the other uh, lecturers. This was amazing. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And yeah, uh, feel free to reach out to me if I can help in any way. Thank you, Marcelo. Nor Maria, your turn, my dear. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am. It's, it's a matter of real honor and pleasure for me to be a part of this amazing, amazing course. It was my, as you know, it was like a dream come true. It feels like just yesterday when we talked about um, introducing this course for medical students, residents, and early career neurosurgeons. So it's uh, it's like a dream come true for me. And I think that uh, it's a moment of great uh, joy and pride for us to conclude our first cycle after one year of successful webinars that we hold each month. So again, thank you very much for this opportunity. It was, um, it has been, uh, you know, an amazing ride. Uh, so far, it was fun learning together. And I'm really thankful and grateful to all the wonderful speakers who have uh, delivered their amazing lectures so far for the cycle number one. And uh, we are already quite excited to start our cycle number two after the completion of this cycle number one today. So I'm also um, really grateful to all our um, attendees who have been so uh, regular and who have been, you know, a lot of, you know, this showed a lot of keenness in learning more about pediatric neurosurgery. Like I have mentioned before that uh, we do not have uh, pediatric neurosurgery fellowship training in Pakistan. We don't have pediatric neurosurgeons. We don't have any specialists training over here so it was uh, for my, for me and for my colleagues and others and the students basically i'm i'm i completed my training so um, more of that uh, for my colleagues who are young neurosurgeons early career neurosurgeons my juniors who are still in training and those medical students who are affiliated with my hospital, I do think that it was a huge privilege and an opportunity to learn more about pediatric neurosurgery. So a big thanks to ISPN for making it possible for many of us who are around the world without uh, this privilege of having a specialty training. Uh, it was um, a lot uh, it was great because we all have these pediatric cases we face them daily each day when we are working even as a pediatric as an adult neurosurgeon so we still find uh, these cases um, like uh, like if I exemplify Pakistan, we have just in my city there is just one pediatric neurosurgery center, uh, which is known as Children Complex, and most of the time just so much overfilled. So we usually I um I've been working as an adult adult surgeon, but still we use we still get uh, pediatric patients as well. So again, thank you very much, um, and I'm I think we are all like looking forward to welcome you in our cycle number two. And big thanks to Madam Nelsie. It was it's a privilege to learn from you and uh, learn how to deal with everything, how to organize. And it was, um, it's, it, it, we are a big, huge, happy ISPN family, I guess. Thank you very much, Norma Maria. She was very active during these uh, 12 models, um, preparing MCQs, um, looking at uh, the bio from all the speakers and active also in social media that I can uh, <laughs> do the same on my side, but she did a very good job. Linda, it was fantastic support on the backstage, every single webinar, questions, emails, uh, 
It was fantastic to have you with us. Gratitude for our president, uh, one to you, ISPN, uh, that uh, gave us all the support. The past president, Rick Boop, it was supportive as well. And the president-elect, Shlomi Constantini, also uh, gave us all the support we need to reach more than 5,000 uh, people on these uh, 12 models uh, each month. Now we will have a break, two months break, to give you some time. And probably on the next webinar series, we will focus on study design. It's not close uh, every single topic, but we are uh, organized, preparing for the next uh, 12 webinars also, once a month, uh, online also. And I hope you can join us in Viña del Mar, uh, Chile, next October mm -hmm. in our annual meeting. And uh, thanks a lot for all your support, your time. Ana Laura, Jorge Diaz, Sudipa Kummer, and Marcelo Strauss, you give these brilliant lectures, answer all the questions. And gratitude for our audience, our work and our time to be here is all for you. And they encourage us uh, to keep going, keep doing. And the MCQs will be available for much more minutes. Don't worry, Linda will keep this Zoom open. Thank you very much and see you around. Maybe next webinar we can talk to each other. Thank you very much.